You are with The Platform. Uh, my name is Ben Espiner. I'm not Sean Plunkett. As you might have heard earlier, I'm doing uh, this interview. I'll make a slight correction. Our next guest is in Nigeria, not uh, Namibia. Um, but just a quick background on me so I'm not sort of just a floating voice. Uh, my name's Ben. I've been a producer on this show for, since the start of this year, roundabout. Um, you may also know me from the Complaints Department, which is a role I conduct to varying success. Um, and I've written a column or two as well. And I'm in here this morning because a group of academics have gotten something wrong. Um, now, if anything was the definition of newsworthy, that is. Uh, a study on vaping harm conducted by Otago University's Nick Wilson, Jennifer Summers and Tony Blakey claimed that vaping was a third as harmful uh, as smoking. The paper has since been corrected following a review of the paper uh, by UK-based counterfactual consulting CEO Clive Bates. Uh, and Clive should be with us now. Can you hear me, Clive? Sorry, Please. I have my laptop lid closed. No, okay. no, no, that's all right. Clive, what are you doing in uh, Nigeria, by the way? Well, acting really unprofessionally in interview, entering this interview, obviously. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I mean, I live here, basically. My, my wife's a diplomat, and I, I, I work here. Um, I sort of work globally, and, you know, if the internet works, you can work anywhere in the world. Oh, uh, that's the one. Days, so, uh, exactly. Yeah. Nice one. Um, so, Clive, what's your, we'll start off, what's your background? Um, you ha you, you, what's uh, counterfactual consulting? What have you done on this sort of stuff uh, in the past? Yeah, I mean, I, I've, uh, my background's actually mainly in uh, environment, energy and sustainability. But um, for a while, I ran Action on Smoking and Health in the UK, which is, you know, ASH UK, which is the main campaigning organisation against the harms of smoking. Uh, in the UK, and I became interested in this subject, you know, smoking and vaping. It's still um, one of the biggest public health issues in the entire world and in most countries, including in New Zealand. So I, I, I've taken an interest in it and remained involved. Um, I left ASH, I became a civil servant, and then I set up my own consultancy. Um, but I don't take uh, funds from the from the from any of the industries involved. I'm not doing that sort of thing. I, I'm in it for public health reasons. Okay, and um, what, now this particular paper we're talking about, uh, what did these academics uh, claim about vaping harm that you and your co-authors took issue with, um, and, and sort of how wrong were they? Well, I mean, they, uh, the, the, I mean, a bit, there's a big question in the world, is if you, if you switch to vaping or you vape instead of smoking, how much less risky is it? I mean, we know that smoking is incredibly risky, kills one in two, causes cancer, heart disease, lops about 10 years off your life and is is pretty terrible but how risky is vaping really matters now the consensus view in the uk is at least 95 percent less risky than smoking that would be vaping um, that's the royal college of physicians public health england and its successors would all say it's a small fraction of the the risk of vaping but there's been a worldwide i would call it a campaign to be honest to try and exaggerate the risks of vaping, um, partly because people feel that people should just quit smoking and just not use nicotine at all. They should give up, not give up smoking and vaping and just become abstinent. And therefore, this harm reduction kind of approach is a, a kind of compromise. So we've seen a lot of estimates or people trying to argue that vaping is much, much more harmful than it was. And this paper from the Otago Group um, basically argued that vaping is about one third of the risk of smoking. But once you got under the, and understood what they'd done, that number didn't hold up at all. In fact, it was wildly inaccurate. And so what particular um, aspects did they sort of not oversee correctly? What were the inconsistencies that you saw there? And do you think that that's sort of a um, industry-wide oversight from a lot of academics who are Pos uh, positing these ideas? Yeah, I mean, what, what they set out to do is, you know, on the face of it, a reasonably good idea. You, what you're trying to do is measure what are called biomarkers of, you know, biomarkers of risk, which are or biomarkers of exposure, which are, you know, how, how much toxicants do you find in the blood, the saliva, the urine? So you pick a toxicant like uh, nitrosamines or aldehydes or uh, carbon monoxide or something, and you measure the blood or the saliva or the urine, you see how much is in there. The problem is you have to do that very carefully. 
and they didn't really do it very carefully here. So there were two main flaws. Um, one is that some of the people who were classed as vapors were also smokers. So what you were getting was a mixture of the toxicants from vaping and smoking. And essentially the data that they were using was contaminated by, by that. The second thing they did, which is a total rookie error, is that they didn't really allow for background exposure. So, you, you know, some of, the, some of these toxicants you get from air pollution, um, from, you know, cooking, from um, just things, things around you all the time. So if you don't smoke or vape, you don't have zero levels of some of these toxicants. So when you do the assessment, you have to subtract the background level from whatever the smoking and vaping level is to get whatever the smoking and vaping added. If, if you see what I mean. And if you just, if you don't do that, you end up ridiculously exaggerating the effect of vaping, which is tiny when you actually do subtract the background level from it. So those two errors, uh, they use 16, 17 data points. Those two errors rendered every single one of the 17 data points that they use completely useless. And therefore the entire estimate fell apart under scrutiny and actually is completely unusable now. And they, they've kind of acknowledged that. Yeah, I've got to say that seems like a stunning admission from the study, uh, the fact that um, a lot of people in the study who were used as exclusive vapors were actually also smokers. I mean, surely that's quite an obvious uh, yeah. issue there. Um, but yeah, so they have it acknowledged... It should have been obvious. <laughs> yeah, did, yeah, well, I think so. Um, it should have been obvious because... Because there was, because basically the the way we saw it um, was that some of these people had quite high levels of carbon monoxide in their blood, and carbon monoxide is something you only really get in any sizable amount from smoking, uh, because it's a product of combustion. It's what you get when you burn something. You don't really get it from vaping. So that should have been a red flag, a warning signal that said, "Hang on a minute here." all these vapors, uh, so-called vapors, are actually contaminated by smoking. I should just say that the, this isn't a study that the, 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 the researchers from Otago didn't actually do the studies themselves. What they did was a, a search of the literature, found all the other studies, and then they did a secondary analysis to try and come up with this number. But they misinterpreted the original studies and came up with a, 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 you know, a completely inaccurate number as a result. And so they have since published um, a review of, or a correction, sorry, of that initial paper. Um, what was that process like? Because you've obviously published that. Did you oh. and your co-authors reach out to them? Um, did they, were they reluctant yeah. to admit uh, the reason for withdrawing those conclusions that they took? Well, we, did, we, we responded to this and we wrote essentially an academic paper, um, but we used one of these preprint servers now to do what's known as a post-publication peer review. So basically anyone can read a paper and they can write an academic critique of another paper using one of these platforms and we did that. Um, and we alerted to them to that and they acknowledged that they'd seen it, of course. And of course, that's the only reason they would have changed it. I mean, people hate changing their papers. Um, it makes them look ridiculous. Very difficult to get an academic and, to admit uh, when they've done something wrong, I suppose. Yeah, it's, ex I mean, it's extremely difficult to do. And um, the publications hate it as well because it means that the editor has been, you know, allowed a bit of a turkey into the into the journal and the peer reviewers all have egg all over their faces because they should have picked up these frankly blatantly obvious errors but didn't so everybody looks like a bit of a clown when you have this so what they should really have done is retract the paper uh, you know removed it completely because by the time the critique was done there was nothing left every single one of the 17 biomarker measures was was misinterpreted or, or wrongly included in their calculation. And the whole purpose of the paper was to create an estimate, in their case, one third of the risk of smoking, which they now acknowledge cannot have been, could not have been done with the data that they used. So the right thing to do is simply take the paper away and leave something. But what, what they've done is publish instead a correction 
perception, which goes through all of or most of their own failings. Uh, and I suppose they ought to have some credit for that. They've they've been fairly candid about just about everywhere where they've where they've gone wrong. Although they've added a few other things, like they've said, oh, we used industry studies and we shouldn't have done, which is again doesn't really you know distracts from the the main problems with the paper. Uh, rather than telling us anything interesting about it. So, so sorry, did you reach out to them and did they respond to you? Have you been in communication with them or were they, they largely ignored? We, 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 reached out, we reached out to them and we emailed them and they knew this, but they did, we didn't really enter into a conversation about it. I mean, it's their responsibility, it's their work, it's their responsibility to correct their work or retract their work in the journal. Um, we, we used a thing called the Kios uh, uh, post-publication peer review server, and we used a thing called PubPeer, uh, which again is a post-publication peer review ser uh, server to uh, essentially alert readers and the authors that this critique existed. And ultimately, they acted on it. It took many months, much, much longer than it should have done. I mean, it should have been all over in a couple of days. But in fact, it took um, it took many months to get to this uh, it, it took many months to get to this position. But now we have a correction. Uh, the paper isn't valid. The uh, estimate has fallen. And we can go back to using more credible sources like the new report that's just been published in the UK by the Office of Health Improvement and Disparities, which again reaffirms that the right way of thinking about this is that vaping is about 95% less risky than smoking and a small fraction of the risk of smoking depending on how you want to express it. Yeah, so that number still stands. Um, you've obviously done a bit of work of this in, uh, in this area in the past. What's your sort of general view yeah. about vaping harm? Um, that number to you still stands. Um, it's much less risky. Yeah, uh, yeah what, 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 what's your general view about it? How much look, do you think? I, I, Go on. Look, we, we don't even know it's going to cause any risk over the long term. Um, but if you use this biomarker data, you look at toxicants in the in the blood, saliva, and uh, urine. That's where these estimates come from. They they see that the level of toxicants ex that the body's exposed to is much much lower, and sometimes below the limits of detection. Some of the toxicants that you get in smoking just aren't there at all, uh, and therefore they they have, and I believe cautiously concluded that saying that vaping is at least 95% less risky than smoking and, and you know, maybe substantially lower than that is a reasonable way of communicating the risk. We won't know for certain and we probably won't know ever what the actual risk is because you'd have to conduct epidemiology for, you know, 50 years or something of people who had only ever vaped and had never smoked. And almost everyone who vapes now had smoked in the past at some point. So we have to make do with these estimates based on toxic exposure rather than epidemiology about disease that would take years and years to, to gather. But, you know, even, even, even some of the estimates, for, say, for cancer, suggest that the risk would be, you know, less than 1%, around 0.4% uh, of the risk for cancer uh, for vaping compared to smoking. That's one of the studies. So they're all in that sort of ballpark, you know, one to two orders of magnitude less risky, put it, you know, more roundly. Right, so yeah, that's the thing, because a lot of the debate in the conversation, particularly in New Zealand, has been, oh, we don't know the long, long-term effects of this. It might be sort of, uh, in terms of cancer, much less risky. Um, but in terms of the long-term effects on the lungs and the respiratory system, do we have, do you think, the uh, tools to measure that even? Or is that something that can be looked well, into? Well, we, 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 don't, we obviously don't know these things. We, we, we don't have time travel. We can't go forward 50 years and look at what actually happened through epidemiology, which is how ultimately the, the risks associated with smoking were discovered. However... At the time when the risks of smoking were discovered, we didn't have the whole science of toxicology. I mean, we, we've had, you know, 60 years of scientific pro progress since then. You know, we've, we've learned a huge amount about toxins in the workplace, for example. Um, so we don't necessarily need to measure everything with epidemiology to know that things are much safer if the toxic exposures are much safer, uh, are much lower.
So we have a scientific basis for having confidence that these pro these products are much less harmful that we didn't have at the time that the smoking risks were first discovered. And as I say, a lot of that comes from occupational exposures, you know, the, the chemicals in the workplace and so on, which have been studied in great depth. And, the, and you can see that the exposures created by vaping many of them would be considered safe in the workplace if you were you know if you were um you know if, if you were exposed to those from your workplace so we can we we it's not that we 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 certainly don't know everything and we can't know everything out into the far future but neither do we know nothing and if we take what we do know which is how much the body is exposed to these toxicants, we can be pretty sure that vaping will be very much less risky than smoking because the burden on the body is so much lower. And it may even be of negligible risk. Um, you know, the body has defenses, it has resilience, it has regenerative capacity. So unless those things are overwhelmed by a high level of exposure, the body just deals with it just as it deals with you know, and environmental hazards all the time. Again, nobody, nobody really knows for sure, but if you know that the toxic exposures are much, much lower, then you can have reasonable confidence that you'll get a big health gain by switching from smoking to vaping. And I think anyone in New Zealand um, should feel confident in doing that. We've not seen a lot of acute effects. We've not seen a lot of people dropping dead or, or becoming sick in the short term. There was an outbreak of lung injuries in the United States, but those were in the end all associated with cannabis vaping and the use of an illicit thickener. So that's been a bit of a distraction, but it's not something that people using nicotine vapes need to worry about. Mm. And also just in terms of regulation, um, it's been a really fascinating discussion. In New Zealand, a lot of the debate around that is, you know, uh, uh, the advertising restrictions aren't heavy enough. They've been uh, sort of tried to be sold towards yeah. children, um, uh, certainly young people have huge access to vapes in New Zealand. Uh, do you think that this is, given what you've just told me about the relative risk, do you think that there needs to be um, some tightening of those restrictions? I have a slightly different, uh, a slightly different take on it, uh, Ben, uh, given what's about to happen in New Zealand. At the moment, the government, the government is pushing three forms of kind of sort of quasi prohibitionist measure so one is to reduce the nicotine in cigarettes right down to very low levels another is to reduce the number of outlets that sell cigarettes by 95 percent and then a third is what they call a smoke-free generation where they increase the age at which you can buy cigarettes by one year every year so basically at, at some cutoff people will never be allowed to in age some will never be allowed to um, buy cigarettes. Now that's a very bold thing to do, uh, put it mildly. Uh, there's a lot that could go wrong, but if that is to work, it will require almost all of the smokers to switch from using a smoking product to a smoke-free nicotine product. I mean, some will quit, that would be good, but people who want to continue nicotine or are dependent on it or get benefits from it in some way, they will need to get their nicotine in some other way. And one of the most promising technologies for that, and again, in fairness to the New Zealand government, they've been reasonably positive about this, is that they should switch to vaping, okay? So for those three big policies to work, New Zealand will have to go in all in on vaping. And therefore, I think they have to try to get as many people who are smoking to take it up as possible. And therefore, more restrictions on it, you know, closing down the advertising, um, making the products dull or bland or not satisfying in some way, that will not help. That will not help with those other big measures. And if those other big measures you know, people don't switch to vaping as a result of that. There will be a huge black market in cigarettes, hand rolling tobacco, cigars and everything. And that's not what we want to happen if those three measures go through. Um, so I would see a, a good vaping market as a better alternative to a black market in smoking products. The two are very closely linked now. Clive, it's been a really fascinating discussion. Thank you uh, so much for joining me on the platform. Thanks, Ben. A pleasure.
Uh, that's Clive Bates there, CEO of Counterfactual Consulting. So there you have it. Um, vaping, obviously, uh, not quite as harmful as certain academics would suggest. Maybe they're just pearl clutching or trying to help the tobacco companies. Uh, who knows?